So welcome back. This is going to be our third and final screencast for Chapter 17. And up to this point, we have been looking at animals that belong to the phylum Annelida. Now, we've looked at the class Polychaeta, which included the clamworms. And we also just finished looking at the class Oligochaeta, which included the earthworms. Now we're going to look at the class that includes the leeches. And this is the class Herudinidae. Now, these animals are considered the true leeches. And what's kind of interesting about the leeches is that they tend to have a set number of segments. And in most cases, that number is going to be approximately 34. Now, what's a little bit different about the leeches is they do actually lack the CT that we had seen, or those very tiny bristles that we had seen in the polychaetes and in the earthworms. Now, they do possess an anterior and a posterior sucker. Now, this kind of makes them very similar to the flukes that we had looked at in Chapter 14, which belong to the phylum platyhelminthes. Now, in terms of diversity, these animals do tend to inhabit mostly freshwater environments. There are a few that actually are marine, and there are a few that have adapted to sort of a moist type of terrestrial environment as well. Now, they're going to be more common in the tropics than you would find in the temperate zones. In other words, you wouldn't find them as much around here. Um, they do vary in color. They can be black, they can be brown, they can be red, and some of them actually do take on sort of an olive green color. Now they are relatively flattened like you had seen with the earthworms. Some are carnivores feeding only on small invertebrates, but others are considered temporary or permanent parasites. And so we're using two words here. If it's a temporary parasite, it basically means that this particular animal is going to attach to its host, um, feed for a brief period of time, then of course drop off. But of course if it's considered a permanent parasite, so we have an animal that's going to permanently attach and definitely cause more harm and in fact could possibly cause death to its host animal. Now, most of the leeches are considered hermaphroditic, again, very similar to what we had looked at in the previous two classes. They do contain both male and female um, reproductive structures in the same animal. They do form a clitellum during the breeding season. So for the most part, if these animals are not actively breeding, it's really difficult to see that band that you would find towards the anterior end of the animal. And it performs pretty much the same function as it had done in the um, earthworms. It does secrete that cocoon, so it secretes that sort of chitinous mucousy layer for the reception of the eggs during reproduction. Now, in regards to form and function, as I had said, they typically have a fixed number of segments. And if you remember back in the previous screen, we had said that's approximately 34. They do appear to have more segments due to what we call superficial annuli. And so if you look here, this segment that you see right here is actually made up of approximately one, and you can kind of see that right there, two, and then maybe three annuli. So if you remember those annuli are simply the rings that you would find surrounding that animal. So all three of these annuli actually make up one segment. And in this case, for this particular group of animals, they actually do not have the septa that we had talked about in the previous group that actually separates the segments. And so in other words, we're talking about that tissue layer that would separate those metameric segments that we had looked at in the previous two groups. Now, there's no CT involved, as we had said. In other words, those bristles do not exist in the leeches. They have developed suckers for attachment. So again, they have both an anterior sucker, like you see over here on the right, and they do have a posterior sucker, um, as you see down here towards the lower right. Now, they do have a gut that has been very specialized for the storage of large quantities of blood. So their digestive system has changed just a bit when compared to the previous two groups. So it's adapted. And again, these are parasitic animals in some cases, so they've adapted to more of a fluid type of um, nutrition or nutritional requirement. Now, most, again, are going to use suckers to attach, and they use those suckers not only to attach to possibly their prey, but also to move throughout their environment. So they have sort of an inchworm type of movement. And over here on the right, you can sort of see that inchworm type of locomotion being represented. So in regards to nutrition, as we said, most of the members of this particular group that we are familiar with are considered either, again, as we had said, either temporary or permanent parasites. But there are quite a few out there that are considered predators, so they are considered predaceous. Um, freshwater leeches, the ones that we're kind of, um, again, familiar with, 
do have what we call a proboscis. Now that proboscis is going to be used to ingest small invertebrates as well as to suck blood. So a proboscis is simply going to be a part of the animal that is going to extend out of the animal to either bring the prey in or to possibly, if it's a parasitic species, maybe to bore a hole in that prey animal or in that um, particular host animal in order for it to be able to suck blood and to feed. Now some terrestrial leeches do feed on insect larvae, some of them do feed on earthworms, and there are a few out there that actually do feed on slugs. Now there's other terrestrial leeches that will actually, believe it or not, climb trees or bushes to actually reach warm-blooded vertebrates. So we're looking at things such as maybe baby birds or maybe some small mammals. Now most are considered fluid feeders and, and what that means is that they prefer tissue fluids and again as we had said blood that's going to be pumped from an open wound. Now what's kind of interesting is that some of them actually produce what we call an anticoagulant. Now what that means is that basically it prevents the blood from clotting and so that allows a continuous flow of either a tissue fluid or the blood from its host animal. Now again, respiration and excretion are going to be similar to the previous two classes that we've looked at, but we do have some leeches that actually will um, parasitize fish that have developed gills. So instead of actually performing a gas exchange across the epidermis, as we had seen in the class before this, um, they actually have adapted and developed a gill-like structure. Now they have 10 to 17 pairs of nephridia. So remember we had talked about the metanephridia with the earthworms. Well the nephridia is pretty much the same structure. It's a structure that actually is used to remove waste from the animal. Now in terms of circulation they have a typical oligochaete circulatory system. Now what we mean by that is they do have what we consider a closed system. All right. And remember, a closed system is going to keep all of that blood within a vessel type structure. Now, there are a few that actually have, in essence, kind of adapted a way to kind of get away from this closed system and kind of revert back to what we had considered sort of a, a primitive open type of system. Remember in the um, mollusks, we had talked about an open system with the um, bivalves and they had structures called solemic sinuses. So these were basic cavities where the blood would pool. So some leeches have sort of adapted and actually developed that type of vascular system. Now when you look at the nervous system and sensory systems of these animals, leeches actually have two brains. Now what's interesting about them is they have what we consider a fused ganglia. Again, it's going to form a ring around the pharynx, and you had seen something similar to this with the earthworms, but they also have a posterior set of fused ganglia as well. So in essence, they kind of have a brain in the front, and they have a brain towards the back. Now they have 21 pairs of segmental ganglia, which is going to form between and along a double nerve cord. So in the earthworms, you had looked at a single nerve cord, but in these animals, they have a double nerve cord. Now the epidermis is going to contain free sensory nerve endings and like the earthworms, photoreceptor cells. So again, they can't actually um, see in their environment, but they can pick up light. Now they do have a row of what we call sensile in the central annulus of each segment. So again, remember, each segment is going to be basically made up of either three to five rings and those rings were called annuli. So there's going to be this particular sensory structure called sensile that's going to be found in each of these segments. Now they do have what we call pigment cup ocelli that are present. So we had said earlier that they do have photoreceptor cells in their epidermis similar to the earthworms, but there are some species out there that do actually have that ocelli, which is a little bit more advanced type of structure, which might make them better adapted at picking up um, Probably not images within their environment, but maybe sensing the light that is in the environment a little bit more accurately. Now reproduction in this particular group is again kind of similar to what we had looked at with the earthworms. As we had said, they are considered hermaphroditic, in other words having both male and female reproductive parts in the same animal, and they do practice cross-fertilization, again like we had seen in the earthworms. The sperm is going to be transferred by hypodermic impregnation. Now what this means is that the um, leeches will simply inject the sperm into the other animal. 
So once this sperm has been transferred, the clitellum is going to go ahead and secrete the cocoon, again similar to what we had seen in the earthworms, to receive the sperm and the egg. And so fertilization is going to take place in this particular cocoon. Now the cocoons are going to be buried in the mud or they're going to be buried in damp soil. And again, development is going to be very similar to the oligochetes that we had looked at in the previous screencast. And so if you look down here towards the bottom, if you notice on the left we have mating leeches and they sort of do sort of an intertwined type of dance when they're reproducing. As we had said, when the parent leech begins to secrete that cocoon, which is going to be secreted by the clitellum, um, that's where the sperm and eggs are going to come together. And remember we had said that usually the um, cocoon that's going to be produced by this clitellum is going to simply slide off of the worm. And it does the exact same thing with the leeches. So the leech is going to withdraw and actually seal the cocoon up. And again, as we had said, this cocoon is going to be buried in either the mud or maybe some damp soil. It's going to remain hidden. And as we had said with the earthworms, they have a direct type of development. So when these eggs hatch, they actually hatch as miniature leeches. All right, so that's going to finish up our third and final screencast for Chapter 17. And as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.